Hello, everyone. Uh, we are very happy to be here today. Um, we're going to, to, to tell you how we migrated to ARM at, at Datadog. So I'm Laurent Bernay, and Eric is, is going to start. Hello. Hi. Yes, I'm Eric Mountain. And uh, so Datadog, we're an observability monitoring and security platform. And uh, we, we ingest an awful lot of data. We present that data to our users. And to run all these services, we need a lot of infrastructure, tens of thousands of hosts running on dozens of Kubernetes service, uh, clusters. This uh, costs a lot of money. So we're, of course, introducing and minimizing our costs. So today, we're here to tell you a bit about, well, why did we want to migrate to ARM, uh, how we bootstrap that initiative, how we then scale the migration once we got past the first few applications uh, running in production on ARM, and what's our strategy today? Now that we've got a lot of applications running on ARM, what do we want to do? Um, so why ARM anyway, for a start? So the game changer was in 2019 when AWS announced the Graviton2 based instances, because these were the first ones to actually be somewhere on par with C5, M5 uh, type instances that are the kinds that we use typically for most of our workloads. So these Graviton 2s seemed capable of running our workloads. And synthetic benchmarks that you can find, like on Pharonix, uh, seem to indicate that indeed performance was good and even possibly better than the, the x86 based uh, offering. Um, also, these new instance types were actually 20% cheaper than the hardware equivalent uh, C5, M5, R5 uh, instances. So it seemed, on paper, a very good offering. Um, to reassure ourselves a little bit, we also did some internal benchmarks on a few uh, applications that we use a lot, so etcd, Redis, Kafka. Uh, here we've got a few results for, for etcd, and we're seeing basically that it's actually 25% faster on top of being 20% cheaper for some real workloads, not just synthetic benchmarks. So this was rather comforting. Um, at the executive level, uh, our CTO, Alexi, he wanted us to, he gave us the mission to go out and try and migrate uh, workloads to ARM uh, to control our costs. Uh, we want to control our costs, and if we can get a certain percentage out from just migrating to ARM, well, that's already a benefit. Um, the ARM footprint is growing fast. We see AWS with new instance types. Apple was uh, driving their own Apple Silicon already at the time, uh, so the ecosystem is maturing. Uh, we thought that most of the effort would be on platform teams like Compute and Build, CI, those kinds of things. We thought as well that adoption criteria would be pretty simple. Either it works or it doesn't work. Um, either it performs better or it performs worse. In the end, it's the cost that has the final word. And we also thought that, well, the first applications that we migrate, they would hit some problems, but this would basically iron out things for the future applications that would come along. It would, they would iron out the teething problems. Um, so at that point, what we're starting with is we know that Graviton2 costs 20% less as the equivalent C5 M5 uh, generations. Uh, we know that applications, uh, companies are using ARM extensively already. Uh, what we don't know is how that's really going to apply to our own applications in terms of performance. And we don't know to what extent we actually re depend on some x86 specifics, for instance. Well, there were some knowns, like for instance, we had applications that depended on uh, hyperscan, which is very specific. Um, but in general, we didn't know what was going to happen. We also knew you know, success is if we can handle the same workload at a lower price, then we've made a gain. And I'll hand over to Laurent. At this point, we're convinced. At this point, we're convinced that we needed to do something about it and uh, at least have a look at what ARM was going to look like for us. So, how do we start? So, in order to understand how, how we did it, uh, we need to get back to how we run things. As Eric says, uh, said earlier, we run everything in Kubernetes at Datadog, right? So, of course, we had to do something about our clusters. Um, this is what our clusters look like, nothing surprising there. Uh, we have node pools for different applications. And, and of course, everything at the time was running on x86. So a very quick note here, I'm gonna try and say x86 and ARM 
it's very likely that at some point I'm going to slip and say AMD 64, which might be confusing, but I'm going to do my best. In any case, it's the same. So of course, what we want to do is we want to be able to migrate some node pools to ARM CPUs to see uh, what, what it gives us for some applications. So what does this require, right? If we zoom on a node, what do we need to do to make it ARM ready? So of course, the first thing is, well, we need to make sure that it's running a distribution that supports ARM. Then we need the Kubernetes component to support ARM, so Kubelet and ContainerD. On our nodes, we run a, a lot of shared services, right, daemon sets. Uh, we run a node local cache, we run the log agent, of course, and we run Cilium to provide CNI. We also need to migrate applications, of course, right? But applications might be a bit more complex than this example here, right? Sometimes you have unit containers, sidecars, a um, whole bunch of unity containers. So let's zoom on, uh, on this and see how it went. So the first thing we did was, well, we needed to find an AMI supporting ARM. Turns out we were very lucky. Uh, Ubuntu provided us with one. It was also very easy for the kubelet. Turns out all the builds in Kubernetes support multiple architectures, and so it was very easy for us to get uh, an ARM-ready kubelet. ContainerD was our first surprise. We assumed it was gonna be very easy for us to get ContainerD for ARM. Turns out there was no ARM release for ContainerD. It wasn't that big a deal. Uh, it turns out Docker provided a package for ContainerD for ARM and x86, so we just changed. Um, and now, actually, ContainerD provides uh, a release for ARM too. Demon sets now. So the first one we migrated was very easy. It turns out no local DNS, so the local DNS cache we use uh, is in the Kubernetes repo that has been provided, providing uh, ARM images for a long time, so that was very easy. The Datadog agent had been supporting ARM for quite some time because, of course, we had some customers running on ARM already. Cilium was one of our first uh, big hurdles, right? At, at the time, we were running Cilium 1.8, which was x86 only. So we figured this might be tricky. We were a bit lucky, though, because while 1.8 was x86 only, we were not the only ones considering ARM, and so there were work uh, happening to make Cilium ARM compatible for the next version. It was quite a big backport, and many thanks uh, to Hammond for doing it, but we backported the patch uh, from 1.9 to 1.8, and we now had a 1.8 ARM-ready Cilium version. In terms of utility containers, so you need containers in sidecars, um, everything was mostly okay, except for a very interesting case. So we use console template extensively uh, in our applications to retrieve secrets from Vault. There was no ARM image upstream, uh, but there was an ARM binary. So we figured, well, it was going to be very easy to adapt the Docker file that was used to build the x86 image to use it for ARM, right? Just change the arch parameter here. Well, we tried that, we built the image and we tried it. It didn't work. It was very confusing. So what we did is, well, we created a container, we exact into it, we try and run the image, uh, the, the binary. And as you can see, we had this very confusing error that says file not found. I promise you the file was there. <laughs> so we looked a bit deeper. Uh, it turns out the reason we were having an issue was that this binary for ARM was linked again to glibc. But if you remember, our image was built from Alpine, right? So it was trying to find a glibc library, but on Alpine, uh, you have muzzle, so it didn't work. That's confusing though, right? Because the only difference is we're using the ARM binary and not the MDA or the x86 one. What's, what's, what's happening? So we looked at the x86 binary, and the x86 binary was actually statically linked, right? So that's why it worked. So what, what happened? Why was console template built differently between x86 and ARM? Well, we, found, we, we went to the repo, and we had a look at the, the pull request making the modification for, for ARM, and we find this interesting pull request here that says, well, there's a specific bug in Go, and so we're going to special case the ARM build to use CGO. Well, for uh, x86, it was using, AC, X, um, it was using normal, uh, Seagull was disabled, sorry. But of course, because uh, then we have a dependency on the, on the build distribution. It turned out the build distribution was using glibc, and so the binary was linked against glibc, but the runtime image was Alpine. The Go bug was, was interesting, right? It's, 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 it's an old bug, but it was triggering crashes on ARM, but not when using Seago. And the bug was fixed in Go 114. It was a very weird bug when you were calling low-level VDSO function uh, and the signal was happening at the same time and the Go runtime was completely crashing. 
So once it was fixed in 114, uh, the change was reverted in console template, and now all the console template builds are also static. In our case, it was easier. We actually just had to, to I just had to change the, the um, image, the base image we used. Instead of Alpine, we used Ubuntu, and it fixed our issue. So as a summary, um, at this point, we had ARM nodes, uh, we had ARM images for our daemon sets, and we had ARM images for our utility containers, sidecars and init containers. We faced a few interesting challenges, showing that the ecosystem was not completely ready at the time, but nothing too big. What, what now, right? Well, we have uh, ARM nodes, but we also need ARM binaries for our applications. And because we run everything in Kubernetes, we also need ARM images for these applications. And what we want to do is we want to make it as simple as possible for application. And to do that, we want them to avoid having to change anything uh, with the M charts, right? We don't want to have any dash arm reference in the M chart or the image references. And to do this in the Docker ecosystem, what you need to do is you need to have a multi-arch image. So what's a multi-arch image? If you look at a static, at a classic image that is not multi-arch, this is what it looks like. Right? If you inspect the manifest of the image, you see this JSON file that is built of, that consists of two things, metadata about the image, and then layers, right? All the layers that are, the image is, is built from. When you look at the multi-arch image, it's slightly different. You see that metadata about the image, but you also have a manifest for each supported architecture, right? And this sub-manifest actually points to um, single architecture manifests. And what happens is when a runtime is seeing a multi-arch image, it's gonna say, well, I'm running on an ARM node or an S66 node, so I know which image I need to pull to run on my node. So we were convinced we wanted to have multi-arch images. Now, what are we going to do to have some? To explain this to you, we need to get back a bit and, and show you how we were doing CI before we migrated to ARM. So all our runners were already running on Kubernetes, right? They were pulling jobs from GitLab and creating pods and jobs in our Kubernetes clusters. We had a specific use case uh, for Docker images because we didn't build Docker images in, in Kubernetes at the time, and so we had dedicated nodes that were running Docker and building Docker images using Docker and Docker and pushing images to registries. And of course, everything was running on x86. So let's see how we made our CI ARM ready. So what we wanted to achieve is we wanted the ability to run ARM, ARM pods, but ARM workloads. But to do this, we need to have ARM nodes, right? We need to build all the images uh, I, I mentioned before. So how do we start? So if we take a very simple uh, Docker file image like this one, right, where you can see here we do two things. We build a simple Go application and we download a simple binary. If we build this image on x86, it's gonna be built uh, very easily, very fine. And if we run it on an x86 node, it's gonna work okay. However, if we try running uh, this image on an ARM node, it's not gonna work, right? Because, well, we don't have uh, an ARM version of it. Recent version of, uh, of Docker have uh, a nice uh, way of building multi-arch images. If instead of using Docker build, using, you use Docker buildx to, to, to build images, you can provide a flag saying all the images you want to build for. So we tried that so on a x 86 node. We, tried building an image for both uh, x86 and ARM. Well, it, started, it starts okay, but as you can see in the middle of the slide, it starts breaking because at some point, we're trying to run something that doesn't work. And what's happening in where we're running our build on an x86 node, but when we're building for ARM, what the runtime is doing, it's pulling the ARM image and trying to run what's in the Docker file. And of course, as we hit the line two of the Docker file here, the apk add command. Well, we're trying to run a binary that was built for ARM on an x 6 node, which of course is failing. So how can we address this? Let's go back to the image. Maybe we can be a bit more clever about it. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with multi-stage build, which allows you to separate building artifacts in an image and then assembling the layers to have the runtime image. Well, if we modify the image we, we, we had before to, to do this, we now have two steps a build phase that will always run on x86, right? And produce artifact both for x86 and ARM. And what's happening, you can see on the slide, is when we're building the Go application for ARM on an x86 node, we're actually cross-compiling, which Go uh, helps us do easily. 
And then in the second stage of the build, what we do is we just assemble layers. And the reason this works is because when we assemble layers, we actually just copy files around, right? There's no command executed, which makes it work on, um, on x86 even when we're building an ARM image. And it's magic, right? We now have the ability uh, to run the same image on both an x86 node and an ARM node. If we get back to our doing CI, you can see that we now have a solution where uh, if we want to build multi-arch images, what we do is we do a multi-stage build and we leverage cost compilation. It works great and it's a, it's a very common way of building multi-arch images today. And for instance, this is the approach that was used by Cilium at the time, probably still the case, I, I haven't checked it recently. However, as you've seen for this very simple image, this requires significant change in the image, right? You see the refactoring was pretty extensive. And it doesn't always work. If in your runtime image, you need to run commands, and a typical example would be you need to install a package, it won't work, right? Because you actually need to run uh, a non-binary on, on an x86 node. So do we have alternatives to, to this solution? If you, if, you, if you look at what Docker suggests on their website in, 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 in matter of how to, to build multi-arch images, what they say is, well, you can also use emulation. So if we, if we get back to our image here, what we want to do is we want to use emulation to run these commands here. So remember, we're trying to build an ARM image on the next 66 node, and, but we're going to run uh, to use um, an ARM image from, from, from the layers, right? And so we're going to be running ARM binaries on this 86 node, and we need this to work. And this is what emulation is going to help. How does this work? It's not that complicated, actually. Uh, you just need to emulate ARM, which you can do with QMU, a uh, standard emulator on x86. And, and also, um, you need to be able to auto-detect that you're trying to run uh, an ARM binary. And on Linux, if you're, you might be familiar with um, BinFMT, which is a way to support miscellaneous binary format and have Linux be able to handle them in multiple different ways. So what happened there is, when Linux is going to detect that you're trying to run an ARM binary, it's going to invoke um, QMU to emulate ARM. Then it works. You still have to do some small changes uh, in your image, but as you can see here, it's pretty minimal. If we get back to our CI, we now have two solutions. The first one is, well, we, do, we can do multi-stage and cross-compilation, and if that doesn't work, you can also use emulation. And this is how we started. The first, the first few months, almost the first year, all the images we built, we built that way. Uh, it sounds like we have a perfect solution, right, between uh, using multi-stage and using emulation. It's not that simple, actually, because emulation is actually sometimes tricky to set up. The first thing is you need the ability to install and configure emulation, which, depending on how you run CI, might be tricky because you need to install QMU and you need to configure it. In addition, building a complex image uh, can take a long time. I gave a small example here. You can see an image taking more than an hour and a half to build. If you remember, now that we have the ability to build the, the, the basic images and to run ARM nodes, we can maybe use these ARM nodes to build ARM binary and ARM images. Let's get back to our clusters. So we have our clusters uh, running pods on x 6 nodes, and we, had, we now have the ability to run ARM nodes too, right, pod and ARM nodes. If we get back to our CI, we have runners able to pull jobs, and we can run this job either on X XT6 or um, uh, on ARM nodes. What if we were building images uh, within this node, right? What we can do is we can run Docker builds uh, within these uh, runners, right? And we'll be able to build an image for X86 and an image for ARM. It's a bit more involved than what I showed earlier because it requires uh, some orchestration because you need to do two builds one on each architecture, and then you need to create a manifest and push it to. Docker provides a, a very nice way to make the user experience a little better uh, by using build decks and using remote builders, right? So instead of building locally when you do a Docker build, what you're gonna say is you're gonna say, Docker, well, use a remote builder. And the remote builder facility uh, provided by Docker is called BuildKit. And you can see here that when you're building this image for both x86 and ARM, we're using BuildKit running on x86 for the x86 image and BuildKit running on ARM for the ARM image, and then assembling this and pushing the multi-arch image. Of course, because we're now doing native builds, it's much faster. So image builds on Kubernetes are, are great, but it wasn't easy to get there. 
And Eric and I actually gave a talk about this uh, at a previous KubeCon, and, and we talked about all the challenges we face to, to make it work. It's likely the best option, but has a lot of gotchas, and it might be easier to start with other options. Now that we, we've seen how we started, let's talk about what we got out of this. Yeah, so at this point, we're able to build Can you hear me now? Yeah, sorry. So at this point, we have, uh, we're able to build container images. We're able to, uh, we have the binaries on ARM as well. Um, so we're able to start migrating applications for real. Um, our strategy was to go first for um, high potential and easy applications. So what do I mean by that? So high potential was like large scale applications. Applications where by migrating them, we would see a big effect because they were many pods, many nodes. Uh, easy applications, we figured that managed language applications would be easiest. So we focused on a large Golang repository where we had lots of applications. And we also took on board some early adopters in Java and Rust. Um, the first application we migrated uh, was something that takes part in the metrics intake. So it's a very high traffic application. Today, it runs on about 4,700 pods. So it was a bit less uh, a few years back, but it was still considerable. It's written in Go. It's load balanced. It's stateless, meaning we don't have to deal with disks, local disks, or attached disks, or anything like that. Um, and because it's load balanced, we can easily have two deployments uh, running on different architectures simultaneously. And that's what we set up. We had the x86 one. We gave it some headroom in case there was a problem with ARM and we could fall back easily uh, without incurring any issues. And we started off with a bit of a canary on, the ARM, on a few ARM nodes, uh, something like four for a little while. It looked good. We then started migrating a third at a time. And we got to the point where we had 100% running on ARM. And we were pretty happy because while this was going on, actually, traffic increased on this application. Uh, but the net effect, all the same, is that we see a reduction of 20% in cost. One little caveat was that it was about 3 to 5% slower. But because we were able to simply scale horizontally and the cost remained cheaper, in the end, it's a win. And we're happy with this application running on ARM. Um, we migrated a second application uh, at this point. Uh, again, part of the metrics intake uh, uh, flow. Um, and this one was even better. We got 20% savings, but we also actually got 5% better throughput. It was performing even better on ARM. So here we've already got two cases, right? Two different applications behaving slightly different in terms of performance, but the net gain is, is positive. We went on migrating a few applications, and progressively we started hitting a few little bugs here and there. Um, so we'll talk a bit about those. Um, one of the next challenges we went for were applications which were stateful. We have a lot of stateful applications, so we need to be able to migrate those, otherwise it's not really interesting. Um, so we have some that use local disks, and what we saw was that the instances were taking several minutes, literally, to actually boot. We traced this to Lux volume encryption, uh, creation. This is because we were encrypting these, these volumes, and we s just generate a random password at boot, and we read dev, uh, dev random to get that password. And it seems that there wasn't enough entropy on the ARM instances to get that password generated quickly. Um, so we switched to DevU random, which is probably what we should have been reading anyway. Uh, and we talked to AWS and Canonical, and this was fixed in the later kernel. It was simply that there was an early boot uh, entropy seed that wasn't being passed in through FE. And once that was fixed, it was all good. Um, I mentioned we also had some Rust apps. Uh, and the first one we migrated, we saw absolutely abysmal performance. Uh, it wasn't just 10 or 20% slower. It was like 10 times slower than x86. And we profiled that, and we realized that what was going on was that uh, the function instant now, which is raiding the monotonic clock, uh, was a lot slower on, on ARM. And uh, with a simple reproducer, we were seeing that it was like 70 times slower. So the reason for this is that Rust at the time didn't trust ARM as a platform to supply a monotonic clock that worked correctly. Uh, there had been some buggy CPUs, and so Rust had implemented a solution based on a mutex to always ensure that it returned a monotonically increasing time. Um, so 
there were actually mitigations in the kernel so that uh, runtime languages and things like that didn't need or user space didn't need to worry about this anymore. So there was really no justification for us to do this any longer. Um, so PR was pushed upstream by uh, the AWS folks. Uh, thank you to them. And um, just got the native implementation and performance was normal again. Um, we also saw some applications which would suddenly stall. So here what you can see is two cases where the uh, ready replicas count decreases by one um, and the liveness probe kicks in uh, and kills the application. And that's why it then starts up again. Um, we, if we look closely at the CPU graph for this, uh, what we realize is that actually the idle CPU never really reaches 100% here. And in fact, there's about a three and a bit percent headroom, which is, corresponds to one CPU. Uh, because this is a 32 CPU machine. And so actually one CPU is just burning away, even though the application isn't working. So we had this with about four applications. The common points were Go 118 and only happening on ARM. And we realized that actually this was a bug that was already mentioned upstream um, in Gen Traceback uh, in Go, which basically builds stack traces by reading the stack and it was misinterpreting the stack and ending up in an infinite loop. So what we did there is, uh, oh, and it's exacerbated by profiling, which we happen to do absolutely everywhere in Go, or almost everywhere. Uh, so there was a fix available upstream. We patched locally until it was released because it was in 1.19. Uh, we had a bit of a gotcha because we were also in the middle of migrating uh, Mac OS laptops from x86 to M1 at the time. And so we had to provide both builds of Go with that fix. And we weren't really equipped to maintain local Go builds. Anyway, at this point, so we've migrated a number of applications. Uh, we've got about 15% uh, of CPU cores uh, on AWS that are using ARM, thanks to all the applications we've migrated bit by bit. Um, we've seen some lack of maturity in the ecosystem, uh, especially in 2021, 2022, but beyond that, we stopped really seeing any problems or not so many problems. Um, performance isn't always as good as hoped, uh, but all the same, it's very promising when we consider the overall cost reduction. So then what we wanted to do was go further. How do we scale this to the organization? So if we recap a little bit, um, first half of 2021, we did the first tests, first benchmarks, uh, and gave ourselves a little bit of confidence. In the second half of 2021, we did all this platform setup with the CI. And uh, in the first half of 2022, we started migrating the first few real applications, hitting bugs in real life and fixing them little by little. Um, and by the end of 2022, we'd migrated all our main repositories, all our large repositories to support ARM, produce the binaries, produce the container images, and we had some of our largest services migrated, hence the 15% CPU cores running on ARM. So then uh, our CTO, Alexis, uh, he said, well, now what I would like to see is all the applications that can run on ARM, I would like them running on ARM by the end of 2023. So we set up a program. Uh, we got some technical project managers working on this. Uh, the first phase was essentially data collection, trying to figure out you know, what are the applications out there that could migrate to ARM, which ones might need exceptions, like are the instance types uh, that we need available because, okay, we had a certain set of Graviton2 instance types, but things, uh, high performance local disk um, instance types, for instance, weren't, uh, were coming out, but might be rare. You might need to deal with capacity issues and things like that on new instances. So we had to collect all that data. Then we kicked into the large scale migration of all the applications which we figured we could migrate. And by the end of 2023, we closed down the program um, because uh, we, we figured we'd reached all the, the main applications that we could migrate. So at that point, uh, well, actually mid-2024, we're at 70% of ARM cores, and we've got a ballpark of 10% savings, which is really good for us. So at this point, uh, we've, we've seen the initial success, we've seen large-scale migration, and we're at the end of 2023, which is uh, about a year ago. And the question is, what's next? 
So if we get back to the original target we had, right? We, we did all these because we expected savings. And as Eric said, we're saving about 10% on compute costs, and you can imagine that at our scale, it's pretty significant. And, and so if the goal is to reduce costs, we need to keep in mind that instance types keep changing and evolving, right? All the business case we built from the beginning was comparing C5 and C6Gs, so all the generation instances, but new instances had been released, and so we need to do this test over and over. So we need to consider new instance type, newer instance types, but also other CPUs, right? Uh, we've mentioned x86 up until now, but when we said x86, uh, we're only seeing uh, mentioning Intel. Turns out AMD was releasing new instances, uh, and some, some of them looked pretty promising. We've also mostly considered AWS because AWS was uh, the first cloud provider to support ARM CPUs. So what about cloud providers? What about other cloud providers? So the, the first thing we did uh, is we automated the internal benchmarks we do, right? So we take synthetic benchmarks that are available and we run them on all the instances we, we have, right? All the instance types that are, that are possible. And that allows for easy comparison between instance types. And you can see here a comparison of all 4x large instance types on AWS and how they perform for two types of benchmark, um, Stockfish and CoreMark. So that's interesting, but that's synthetic benchmark, right? One of the challenges we've seen with, with, with ARM CPUs is they tend to perform pretty well in benchmarks, uh, like very well, as we've seen at the beginning with 20% faster, for instance. But for real life applications, we tend to see gains sometimes, uh, and sometimes a bit, um, sometimes a bit slower, but it, it's not 20% better. So what about real applications? So for some applications, uh, we actually have the ability to test them at a pretty large scale and in a pretty automated way. So we have a team that is very good at doing this and what they do is they test their application on multiple instance types. And, and then they can tell us, well, on this instance type, I'm able to do this amount of work uh, in, an, in an hour. This graph here, for this very specific application, once again, it's not valid for every, every application, is, is saying, well, if you're on this application on, uh, I don't know, um, C7A, for instance, which is uh, the latest, one of the latest AMD instances, you're gonna get 40% more work done um, on, in an hour than if you run it on a C6I, which is uh, an Intel version of it. We also have list prices for all these instance types, right? It's, it's public, uh, public prices. And so what we can do is we can take these two numbers. So the work we get done per hour and the hourly cost of the instances to compare, to, to, to integrate both numbers and see which instance types are the most cost efficient for this specific application. And this is a graph we get, right? If uh, the graph is showing the, what it costs to, uh, to run a unit of work uh, on, across all instance types for this application compared to C6i. And as you can see here, uh, everything that's green is, it means it's cheaper than C6i, which is a reference application. And we can see that we have a few uh, CPUs that are actually cheaper uh, to run this, uh, this application. So we have two sets, uh, two ARM CPUs, Graviton 3 and Graviton 4, and two AMD CPUs, uh, the Gen 3 CPUs and the Gen 4 ones. And you can see that savings are actually pretty significant for this application. We're talking about almost 15% in some cases. So this is the ideal case, right? The case where you can, um, where you can run the application, you can run large scale tests. We have many applications that can't do this type of testing, right? And in that case, we, we wanted to have high level guidelines for the application. And we, we have this very high level guideline that the application can use. So the first one is if you're not CPU bound, use Graviton2. And why use Graviton2 is because, well, it's the cheapest calls, right? So use them, it's gonna be, it's gonna be the best for you. If your application is CPU bound, but it can auto scale, use the CPUs that have the most uh, cost efficient profiles. So exactly the test I was showing before and same results, right? I use the latest AMD CPUs or use the latest Graviton instances. In some cases, if you need a single core, the highest single core performance, we still have several cases where Intel CPUs do better. So we're getting to the end of the talk. Uh, we have a few, a, a few parting words for you in terms of takeaways. So the first one is, uh, if you want to go that, and down that route and, 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 and support multiple architectures, well, invest in, in, in CI earlier, right? Because the CI is gonna, be, is gonna require significant effort to, to get it ready. 
test your applications uh, benchmark uh, only goes so far, right? You want to know how your application will perform on ARM. Something we didn't mention at all is also be careful with capacity planning, right? Because when new CPUs get out, they tend to be much more cost efficient than the previous generations, but you won't be the only ones noticing it, right? And so we find many cases where some new instance types are amazing for us, but we have to wait a bit to get them because they are very hard to get. And, and so be careful with capacity planning and, and, and talk with your cloud providers. Um, ARM is clearly here to stay. Uh, I don't know if you've seen, but last week, GCP announced their own uh, ARM CPUs built in house called Axion, which means they also, they're also uh, doing a significant in investment in ARM. The ARM ecosystem is, is improving very fast. Uh, a few years back, uh, we, we were seeing a lot of small issues, but most of them have been ironed out. I think they're working fine. That said, uh, we can still find a few very interesting edge cases. And for instance, we found a very crazy bug in NLVM that makes Postgres crash, right? Uh, when you run it on, on, on ARM. And we're gonna publish a blog post on, with all the details soon. So it's rare, but you can find very interesting and weird issues. Um, we're we're uh, at the end of the, t of the talk. I don't think we'll have much time for questions. But we'll be around, we'll be around right now, we'll be around during the conference, and you can always uh, come back the booth and come by the data booth where we'll be uh, for some of the day. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>